The Hell's Angels have long been associated with ruthlessness, occupying the pinnacle of all that is glorious in the motorcycle club world. The Hell's Angels Motorcycle Club, often simply referred to as the Hell's Angels, is an iconic name that instantly evokes a mix of intrigue, respect, and apprehension. Established in 1948, this motorcycle club has grown to be a global phenomenon, with chapters spread across continents. As with any entity shrouded in mystery and colored by media portrayals, the club has earned its notoriety with tales of outlaw activities and countercultural stances. Seventeen members and associates of the Hells Angels are facing criminal charges in a violent attack on three African American men in Ocean Beach back in June. The Outlaw Motorcycle Gang, Outlaw Bikers That Were Walking Down the Street, is a member of an Outlaw Motorcycle Gang. As an Outlaw Motorcycle Gang member, ferocious and uncompromising, La Center Clubs, they have earned both the respect and envy of rivals. But amidst this riveting club are a few good and bad apples that have made a name for themselves, from MMA champions to violent drug dealers. These men have given the Hell's Angels a distinct reputation, and today we shall delve deep into their lives and how their actions made the Hell's Angels the most famous motorcycle club in the world. Sunny Barger Our story takes an exhilarating turn as we delve into the life of a resilient leader, a biker boss whom the FBI found challenging to restrain. Against all odds, his unwavering determination and strategic brilliance become the focal point in a saga of triumph over adversity. Sonny Barger, a man who has often been described as the godfather of the outlaw biker culture, a man whose story reads like a Hollywood blockbuster script filled with guts, glory, and plenty of two-wheeled mayhem. From his fearless leadership within the Hell's Angels to his adventures on the open road. His life is a roller coaster that even he doesn't want to get off. And why would he when he leads one of the most notorious motorcycle clubs in the world? From a disturbed upbringing, he rises against all odds to become the very essence of what it means to be a rebel, a renegade, a true outlaw. Brushing shoulders with the FBI on the way, Barger is known for living on the edge and hardly by the rules and his legend is bigger than the American highways he once ruled. But who exactly is Sonny Barger, and what makes him stand out in the outlaw world? Rev up and take on this wild journey of his life and times. In the beginning, in October 1938, Sonny Barger is born as Ralph Hubert Barger Jr. to a mixed family living in Modesto, California. The family's living conditions are not the best, but it doesn't take long for the problems to compound. When he is just four months old, his mother moves away, leaving him and his elder sister Shirley in the care of an alcoholic father and a Pentecostal grandmother who both don't make the best job of it. Things go from bad to worse when Barger's father loses his job as a day laborer on the Oakland docks. But he still tries to make something of his life. Despite being suspended from school for assaulting teachers and fighting with other students, he tries to make a living working at a grocery store before he joins the army. In the army, he develops an interest in masculine camaraderie, learning how to disassemble weapons and the discipline in general. Before he is released for forging his birth certificate to joining upon his return from the army, Barger tries to lead a normal life by taking up menial jobs while living with his father in a single residence in a hotel. Later, he moves in with his sister's family, however, life becomes harder, forcing him into life decisions he never imagined making. Life is a biker. Having been in the military for over a year, Barger has built a network of several military veterans, and he uses that to his advantage, bringing them together to form his first motorcycle club, the Oakland Panthers. At this time, most motorcycle clubs do not admit ex-policemen and military veterans into their clubs, and the Oakland Panthers club provides a sense of belonging for these individuals. However, the club is unable to sustain itself, and it gets disbanded in 1957, less than a year after its formation. Despite failing in his first attempt, Barger is determined. So together with a group of bikers, 
he forms the Hells Angels in April 1957. For the first time, they wear a logo with a small skull wearing an aviator cap set within a set of wings, which is later copyrighted as the Hells Angels Death's Head logo. With time, Barger establishes himself as the most famous biker in Oakland, with people often mistaking him for the founder of the Hells Angels. Unknown to him and his colleagues, there are other older chapters in California using the Hells Angels name. After an encounter with an established member of the Hells Angels Southern California chapter, Barger realizes that there are other small chapters. He embarks on a journey to learn more about the history, existing rules, and procedures of the established Hells Angels. Afterward, he is appointed the president of the Oakland chapter. 1958 proves to be an eventful year in Barger's life, as he is proclaimed the de facto national president after the founder of the San Bernardino chapter, Otto Frido, is imprisoned. It doesn't take time before he starts making major changes. Taking the reins as the national president, one of the first orders of business for Barger is to relocate the national headquarters from San Bernardino to Oakland. It is either that or he has to move town so that he can run the Hells Angels affairs more effectively, and the decision is an easy one. Under his leadership, the bike gang becomes increasingly strong, and his direct involvement in its activities leaves him with a fractured skull after a brawl with Oakland police in 1958. He goes on to strengthen the club's ethics by introducing new, stricter rules for the admission of new members and the establishment of new chapters with a more organized approach to their activities. Barger's Hells Angels become an increasingly attractive club for bikers seeking to join a top club. This leads to growth not only in policy implementation but also in numbers. It also means the establishment of an impressively extensive narcotics network, all despite the fact that he specifically implemented rules against drug burns and using dope. During a meeting in 1960, Barger convenes a meeting of the leaders of the Hells Angels and other California motorcycle clubs. According to former Hells Angels member turned police informant George Weather, he calls the meeting to discuss the challenges that the clubs were facing and harassment by the police comes on top of the list. Barger maintains that the law enforcement agencies should consider Hells Angels members as law-abiding citizens who pose no threat to anyone around them. But the authorities think differently. A biker life of crime before 1963, Barger's face is relatively unknown to the local authorities, and he prefers to keep it that way, as he can get away with anything as long as he can cover it up well. Moreover, he wouldn't want to expose himself as the national president. However, things take a quick turn later that year when a standoff ensues between the local police, the California Highway Patrol, and the Hells Angels on their way from an outlaw motorcycle meeting in Porterville. The encounter sets a chain of events rolling, which ultimately leads to Barger's arrest for possession of marijuana the following year. In 1964, he is arrested on the same charge, and as things get hot, he implements cautions such as banning women from joining, citing their inability to protect themselves from the police and rival gangs. In 1965 and 1966, he is arrested twice for assault with a deadly weapon. In the 1965 incident, he forced a pistol into a club patron's mouth and shot him twice for speaking ill against the Hells Angels. Even rival gangs are not spared from Barger's rage, and they found out the hard way when some of them stole his bike, and he had them whipped with bullwhips and beaten with spiked dog collars before using bullpen hammers to break their fingers. The Oakland Hells Angels continue to establish their authority as the largest and strongest biker gang in the US, and Barger's influence is felt outside and inside the club. In his book Hells Angels, the strange and terrible saga of the outlaw motorcycle gangs, author and journalist Hunter S. Thompson writes about Barger, saying that in any gathering of Hell's Angels, there is no doubt who is running the show. Describing him as a 6 foot 170 pounds warehouseman from East Oakland, the coolest head in the lot, and a tough, quick thinking dealer when any action starts. About his character, 
Thompson says that by turns, he is a fanatic, a philosopher, a brawler, a shrewd compromiser, and a final arbitrator. On the FBI radar, when Barger joined the Hells Angels, he had brought with him his group of army veterans, and together they consider themselves anti-subversive and anti-communist. Part of a group of demonstrators marching from Barclay to Oakland to protest against munition shipments in October 1965, catches the FBI's attention. After copywriting the Hells Angels' name and dipping his toes into film consultation, Barger and the Hells Angels started selling PCP, also known as Dust of the Angels, one of the most popular drugs at the time. For the first time in 1967, the Hells Angels enter the FBI's comprehensive list of criminal organizations, and it is there to stay. Even when the PCP wave passes, they catch the latest methamphetamine train. As FBI agent Tim Kinley, who handled more Hells Angels-related cases than his peers, noted, Barger even goes ahead and hires an experienced chemist, a former employee of the Royal Dutch Shell Oil Company, to teach his crew how to make methamphetamine. Barger even leads the Hells Angels in surrendering hundreds of guns and pounds of explosives to the police in exchange for the release of arrested members. The exercise continues for five years, during which their main focus is on drug dealing. In January 1972, Barger is arrested with four other Hells Angels and charged with attempted murder, kidnapping, an assault with a deadly weapon after three badly beaten men are discovered in the back of their car. During their arraignment, more charges are added to the list, including killing rival drug dealers and continued possession of firearms, despite agreeing to surrender them due to the incriminating evidence. He is sentenced to 10 years imprisonment, and he continues to lead the motorcycle club from his cell at the Folsom State Prison. He is paroled in 1978 and arrested less than a year later for parole violation by owning firearms. However, his wife admits that the firearms are hers, and he is acquitted in the RICO trial in what is the most substantial effort yet by the FBI and local authorities to bring down Barger and the club for good. He and different associates from almost every Hells Angels chapter are indicted on Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. RICO e statutes in June 1979. The prosecution team representing the government in the trial tries to demonstrate a pattern of behaviors, but the FBI, through McKinley, feels like the case is poorly prepared. Moreover, the FBI doesn't even have enough surveillance evidence to support the case, and the trial ended in a mistrial, leading to Barge's release. Inside Operation Cacus, Losing the RICO case fuels the FBI into a more cautious and calculated approach to gathering evidence. But first, they have to find someone to help them gather inside information, and they find the perfect man, Anthony Tate. Tate, being the sergeant at arms of the Alaskan Hells Angels chapter, is close to the higher-ups, and he is more than happy to help for a fee. The FBI wants to take their time and Tate's availability commences a three-year nationwide organized crime drug enforcement task force investigation, which would come to be known as Operation Cacus. During the course of the operation, Tate is tasked with going around the country buying firearms, drugs, and explosives from various Hells Angels chapters. He also wears a wire to record major meetings, especially as Barger was involved. In one recorded meeting, Barger praises Tyatt for representing the Hells Angels of the 90s due to his efficiency in every task he carried out for the club. Tate becomes one of Barger's right-hand men, and he records their conversations and errands for the FBI. Over the next three years, the FBI gathers enough evidence, and they decide to act on their intelligence. In 1987, just before the bombing of the outlaw Chicago headquarters as retaliation for the murder of an Anchorage Hells Angels member. On the 10th of November, 1987, a total of 38 Hells Angels leaders, members, and associates are arrested in California, Alaska, Kentucky, and North and South Carolina on various conspiracy, weapons, and narcotics charges. Barger is arrested on the same day in the Bay Area, 
where over 400 FBI, ATF, and California State Police officers raid homes and establishments believed to house Hell's Angel members. Most of the members are charged with drug offenses, but Barger and his right-hand man, Michael O'Farrell, are also charged with conspiring to violate federal firearms and explosives laws. The trial goes on for three months, and its costs are up to $1 million before Barger is sentenced to 57 months in prison. He still tries to appeal the decision, but the decision is upheld, and he spends four and a half years in prison before being released in 1992. Upon release, Barger receives a lot of attention from journalists seeking interviews to the outlaws who still have a grudge with him. However, Barger steps down from the Hells Angels leadership group before he died of liver cancer in his California home in June 2022. George Christie Imagine a character who transcends the boundaries of a motorcycle club, leaving an everlasting impact on the wider cultural canvas. That's who this next story is about, a man who not only withstood the trials imposed by the Hells Angels but also emerged as a force that transformed the club's perceptions. His story is more than just bike revs and leather jackets. He is fearless, charismatic, and uniquely able to navigate through the rough and tumble of the biker gang world. Christie's story is one for the books, and with the experience he racks up. He is like a walking encyclopedia of Hell's Angels history, filled with tales intriguing enough to have anyone on the edge of their cozy Harley Davidson bike. But how does a man who initially joined the club on probation rise to become one of the most visionary Hell's Angels leaders? How is it that even after getting on the FBI's most wanted list, he is still influential in the Hell's Angels biker gang? Well, it's a mystery we are more than willing to unravel together, so buckle up and let's hit the open road. Where the story began, born in 1947 to Greek immigrant parents living in Ventura, California, George Christie Jr. is brought up in a loving, protective, and gentle family. While no one around him can predict his future in the bike club world, there's clearly something special about him as a child. However, when he visits Los Angeles with his father, his first ever encounter with a biker changes his perspective on the biker subculture forever. He notices that everyone around is paying attention to the biker, but the biker is not concerned about what everyone else thinks. In high school, his personality astonishes many, including his principal, who accuses him of cheating when he scores highly on an IQ test. In turn, this changes his entire perspective on life, and at the age of 19, he already owns a Harley Davidson panhead, which is licensed enough for him to join a bike club and enter the biking world. After acquiring his first motorcycle for just $200 in 1966, Christ becomes a member of two outlaw biker gangs in succession, the Question Marks of Ventura and the Satan Slaves of Los Angeles. In these clubs, he is held in high regard, being one of the few outlaw bikers in America with a college degree. At this time, he is also working as an electrician for the Defense Department, and he marries his high school sweetheart, Cheryl. In bed with the angels, feeling the need to upgrade, Christie begins associating with prominent motorcycle members before finally moving on to the Hells Angels in 1970, five as a probationary member. Within the next year, Christie establishes himself within the club, and his prowess is rewarded with initiation as a full-patch member of the Los Angeles County chapter. His determination to quickly move up the ranks is clear, and according to him, he really wanted to make a statement of some sort. It really wasn't the thought of criminality, it was more an interest to rebel. It was a commitment most learn real fast. In the 1970s, the concept of bike gangs is still new, and rivalries are not established. As Christie recalls, conflicts are not taken all that seriously, and instead of getting out guns after a fight, the losers would just buy breakfast. One of the reasons Christie falls in love with the biker gang is their inclusivity. Despite him being married and having children, he is fully accepted. He carries out club duties during the weekends and at night, as he is committed to family and work matters. 
but that doesn't prevent him from being elected to the chapter's president seat just six months after becoming a full-fledged member. However, the Hells Angels culture gradually changes with the establishment of more rival gangs. In the first brawl of its kind, which would change the history of the Hells Angels, Christie and nine other members are at a motorcycle swap meet in Anaheim when they are attacked by the Mongols. The Mongols attack the defenseless Hells Angels in their numbers, but Christie and his friends manage to leave most of them with serious injuries before leaving. After that, the Mongols wear a patch reading California on their attire to show that they were the ones in charge. The Hells Angels have to take serious action before the disrespect escalates, and in July 1977, they vote unanimously to defend their territory by all means necessary, even if it means declaring war on their rivals who are not ready for what comes next. In the next four months after the vote, an escalation in violence leads to the deaths of four Mongol members and an innocent 15-year-old boy during various shootings and bombings around San Diego and Los Angeles. Within the first five months of 1978, Christie manages to oversee the establishment of two new Hells Angels chapters, the Chatsworth based San Fernando Valley chapter, approved by the Oakland Hells Angels leaders and formed by members of the Satan Slaves who patch over in numbers, and the Ventura County chapter, which he subsequently forms. As things continue to heat up, he is fired from the Defense Department due to his Hells Angels connection. But he is already the most popular man in Ventura County, dominating its political and economic life. While his image in the county is admirable, in 1983, the California Organized Crime Control accuses the bike club of being the epitome of all outlaw motorcycle gangs, claims he denies, stating that it is merely a motorcycle club and a family. In efforts to further discredit the Hells Angels and depopularize them in Ventura, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, ATF, circulates a rumor that the gang plans to disrupt the 1984 Summer Olympics set to be held in Los Angeles by supplying weapons to terrorists for an attack on Lake Casitas, which is hosting water sports. The ATF even visits business people in the county with pictures of Christie and other members to try and discredit them and assassinate their characters. When word gets to Christie, the Ventura chapter raises the $3,000 fee for Christie to carry the Olympic torch for one kilometer through Oxnard as part of the opening ritual for the Olympics. Christie achieves the feat and he is cheered on by numerous Hells Angels, Crucifiers, and Heathens Bike Club members. When he arrives in a remote pea field outside Point Mugu, the Olympic officials are initially unaware of the donation check, which is signed HCUS. But when Christie calls to explain that he wanted the money allocated specifically for a Special Olympics chapter in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, he is told that the donations are not designated directly for local programs. He sues the Los Angeles Olympic Organizing Committee twice, lawsuits which are both thrown out especially as every document he submits is stamped with the Hells Angels' death logo. With the controversies being aired on national television, Christie is now considered the second most powerful Hells Angel in the United States, behind only the international president Sonny Barger. He firmly denies the claims to avoid the attention on him, but is he a bit too late? On the radar and a close call after the 1984 Olympic saga, Christie ups to lie low but he can only do so for so long before Sonny Barger is diagnosed with throat cancer, loses his voice, and Christie has to become the public face of the Hells Angels. If the Olympic lawsuit had already brought Christie to the attention of local law enforcement authorities, becoming the face of the club did more than that. The attention brings the FBI to his doorstep, and a sting operation against him is launched in 1986. In need of someone to lure Christie into their trap, the Bureau assigns Michael Mulhern, a senior member of the Mexican Mafia and an FBI informant, to the case. Mulhern is told to make Christie an offer to hire the Mexican Mafia to kill Thomas Arthur Cheney, a former Ventura Hells Angel who outed the club's drug operations to the federal authorities.
and was being held in the Federal Correctional Institution in Safford, Arizona. Every conversation between them is recorded and delivered to the FBI, and Christie eventually takes the bait, offering Mulhern $500 and a 1973 Pontiac automobile for Cheney's head. Once the deal is on, the Bureau fakes Cheney's death and Christ is arrested red-handed in the process of delivering Mulhern's pay in a motel room. Despite the numerous recordings and physical evidence presented, Christie has since maintained his innocence, claiming that the money was for old debt repayment and not payment for murder. However, once Mulhern gives his testimony in court, Christie seems to be in hot soup. However, his attorney is too good to be beaten, maintaining the argument that the authorities were retributive after Christie had accused them of harassing the club members, and using the fame he gained after the 1984 Olympic torch relay to call them out publicly. Moreover, when the attorney puts Mulhern on the stand, everyone in the courtroom is led to discover his true identity as unlikable, insincere, and a pathological liar. As a result, the federal prosecutors are severely embarrassed, and with their case relying on their star witness, Christ is acquitted. He proceeds to host a party at the Hells Angels Ventura Clubhouse in the attendance of the members of the jury that set him free. It also serves as a fresh start to a life he never imagined himself living. Fame, fame, fame. After his heroics in court, Christie becomes more famous than ever, and the reputation of the Hells Angels rests in his hands. His influence is felt not only in the towns, but also in schools, where he is invited to speak at high school and college graduation ceremonies. This only makes his role in the Hells Angels more prominent, making him a media darling. With the Hells Angels' foothold in the US increasing, the club files a federal trademark infringement suit against Concord New Horizons for producing a film with Hells Angels in it, without permission a case that is ultimately settled out of court. In all his interviews, Christ insists that the Hells Angels as an institution are not involved in drug dealing, and that any member court engaging in drug dealing is thoroughly punished, even though law enforcement has a different opinion. A police officer in Ventura County even says about the club, that they've taken the position right from the start that if they don't screw up in Ventura very much, there will be no reason for the police to hassle them and that has been pretty much the case. The Hells Angels locally have been involved in very few provable criminal incidents. The authorities also believe that by building a good reputation within the community, Christie ensures that the Hells Angels are too careful not to get caught, and if they are, they can get away with it. On his end, he runs legitimate businesses, including a tattoo parlor, a martial arts studio, a bail bonds firm and a pornographic company. He also loves teaching karate and kung fu, which all create the perfect cover. However, it's only a short time before some fresh blood in the club begins to show themselves off, making them easier targets for the police and creating a major problem for Christie. Allegations and convictions Despite already doing a good job of making the Hells Angels famous, Christie embarks on a journey to move the club forward and into the next century. And how does he do it? Starting with his 18-year-old son, George Christie III, he encourages a bunch of young boys to join the club, much to the annoyance of the older group. He even grants his son a full-patch membership against the club rules that he must have attained the age of 21. The police notice the young men constantly hanging around Christ, always dressed in skateboard style, wearing baseball caps backward, and listening to hip-hop and rap music. In 1998, Christie's son and the younger group form the outfit, a group of teenagers who spread Vicodin, a highly addictive painkiller, in Ventura County high schools. The group is also tasked with watching the police movements and alerting the older Hells Angels in case of raids. The police effectively follow the Vicodin trail and raid Christie's tattoo parlor, the Ink House, his house, and his now ex-wife Cheryl's house, where they find thousands of Vicodin pills connecting the outfit to the Hells Angels and Christie. Christ and other club members are arrested, 
but the lack of cooperation between the sheriff's office and the DA's office sees Christ cut a deal in which he serves almost no jail time, served for the vicar in possession and distribution charge. For other counts, Christie only pleads guilty to possession of two grams of cocaine and methamphetamine and being under the influence of a controlled substance, which gets him eight months of probation. Meanwhile, with his father's arrest and arraignment, Christy III gets a taste of how life in a biker gang can be, and he resigns to become a chef and lead a normal life. The draining case remains the longest and most expensive in Ventura history, and the residents are unhappy that despite the resources used, no one serves any significant jail term. The end of an era. In April 2011, Christie announces at a meeting that he is leaving the Hells Angels on the grounds that the club is too competitive, which may lead to internal struggles. Having done more than enough to establish the club as a dominant force among other outlaw biker clubs, he is expected to keep his jacket with the Hells Angels patch. But he instead returns it, saying that he is no longer a Hells Angel for good. However, claims later surface that he was forced out of the club, especially fueled by his successor Scott Sutton, who claims that he retired because he was about to be expelled for abuse of power. Even Sonny Barger bans all Hell's Angels from having any contact with Christie, proving that there were other mitigating factors behind his retirement. Even in his retirement, Christie still rubs shoulders with law enforcement, having been arrested by the FBI over the bombing of two tattoo shops in 2007 with the intention of eliminating opposition to his own tattoo shop. He pleads guilty to one charge in exchange for the others being dropped, for which he serves a 10-month sentence at the Federal Correctional Institution, Lompoc. While he hardly speaks about his time with the Hells Angels, the 2013 documentary The Last American Outlaw and his 2016 memoir Exile on Front Street give a detailed account of his life events and his contribution to the club's fame, which cannot be understated. Christian Ireland In the dark underbelly of Frankfurt, where secrets and shadows intertwine, one man rises to defy all expectations. He is a popular MMA champion with a string of brothel and strip clubs in Frankfurt. However, he is married to the daughter of a notorious Hells Angels boss and is a member of the club himself. This surprisingly loving family man presents his extraordinary life on social media with success, garnering hundreds of thousands of fans and giving him influencer status. He does not shy away from promoting the Hells Angels, but how does a boy from humble beginnings rise to become a prominent German Hells Angels? Influencer born in the bleak November of 1986, Christian Ireland is an unassuming boy hailing from a town near Frankfurt. He starts life with big dreams, with becoming a professional football player topping the list. He gets closer to this dream when invited to a trial session with a renowned football club at the tender age of 16. On the first training sessions, he flops, but the coach sees a relentless fire burning within him and gives him a second chance. His relentless ambition and unwavering dedication lead him to sign a contract with SV Dar at 98. For years, he toils in the second league, striving for greatness, but success in football remains elusive. A twist of fate propels him towards a new path. Yes, appetite for more than just football becomes evident. Since the age of 15, he hones his skills in the boxing ring alongside his football pursuits. An unexpected altercation at a party becomes a turning point when he defends himself against four attackers, leaving three of them sprawled on the ground. Here, Daniel W.L., a professional MMA fighter, witnesses his remarkable abilities and extends an invitation to train. Mixed martial arts, MMA, becomes Ekelin's new passion, a combination of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, boxing, Muay Thai, and wrestling. Christian, as a fighter, is dedicated. He gives his all in the gym, obsessed with MMA. By the age of 19, he is winning professional fights, demonstrating unparalleled dedication. Intriguingly, Irene leads a double life, by day a fighter with boundless energy, and by night, 
a bodyguard at a strip club owned by a powerful Hells Angels member known as Schnitzel Walter. Destiny brings E.S. path to cross with Domin, the boss's daughter, on a fateful night. Back in Germany, he is asked to keep an eye on her multiple times, leading to them falling in love. Yet, Christian's life is anything but a fairy tale. A good friend, Neil Schlagel, emphasizes the importance of finding a sponsor for success in the MMA scene. Schnitzel Walter, the powerful German Hell's Angel, agrees to fund him. Ready to take off, Christian meets world champion MMA fighters like George S. Pierre, improving his technique and coordination. Eckelin's exceptional dedication pays off with six consecutive wins. He feels untouchable, becoming a GMC welterweight champion and receiving an award for the GMP1 knockout of the year in 2010. However, in the following years, maintaining his streak becomes challenging. Fights against experienced MMA talents inside the Russian M1 Global League, including Arsen Tamir Karnov and Razel Abdulliv, in front of over 20,000 fans, prove tough. The relentless world of MMA takes its toll, with a string of defeats leaving Irin with a broken hand, prompting a temporary withdrawal from the sport. He ventures into the brothel business, managing his boss's establishments, further entangling himself in the web of the Hell's Angels. Today, Irin runs three brothels and one table dance bar. He is also a member of the dreaded Hell's Angels Motorcycle Club, an underworld empire presided over by his father-in-law Schnitzel Walter, who wields control over Frankfurt's red light district. Eckelins. Allegiance to the club is unwavering, proudly displayed through tattoos, including the infamous death's head bearing the number 81. Erin now manages most of his strip clubs because his former boss and father-in-law want to slow down a bit after decades of hard work. He doesn't talk much about this topic on social media, but confirmed it during an interview, stating, Are you a member of the Hells Angels? For the viewers, I don't really care. Yes, yes, I am, and I have nothing to hide. I've got lots of friends there, and yes, no doubt. In 2017, Ireland makes a triumphant return to the MMA arena after being away for four years. His opponent, Giovanni Melillo, a formidable adversary, marks the beginning of a remarkable comeback. After knocking him down, Irin wins his next seven fights undefeated. However, the passionate biker faces the most controversial fight of his life on June 4, 2022. In front of a roaring crowd of 10,000 fans in Frankfurt, Ireland faces Denilson Neves Traitor de Oliva, a renowned Brazilian fighter. In the first round, Oliva throws a kick that the referee calls a low blow, ruling it as an illegal strike. Irin is given a second chance through an injury timeout, recovers, and manages to finish his opponent in the second round via ground and pound TKO. However, after the bout is reviewed by the governing body of MMA in Germany, the result is changed to no contest, indicating that neither of them had won. Unsatisfied, Irin immediately demands a rematch. The rematch, held on October 15, 2022, sees Irin confront his opponent with unwavering determination. All tickets are sold out, and rounds of grueling combat lead to an electrifying climax as Irland secures victory through a rear naked choke. It is a moment of redemption and triumph, solidifying his legacy in the MMA world. But beyond the cage and the shadows, Christian Irin leads a life of contrasts, a loving father, a producer of YouTube videos, and a connoisseur of sports cars. He unveils his opulent lifestyle on social media, intertwined with glimpses of his cherished family. His fleet consists of a Lamborghini Urus, a Porsche Cayenne, a Ferrari 812 GTS, and a Porsche 911. Irin is blessed with two children and a supportive wife. Despite his martial arts background, he is a calm and loving father. With over 170,000 subscribers and 44 million views on YouTube, Irin has become an influential figure. 
his videos showcase not only his extravagant life but also his training sessions with celebrities, aiming to reshape the German MMA landscape with every fight. In his next fight for Octagon, Irin aims to change the German MMA scene. His opponent hasn't been revealed yet, and we can only wait. However, going by how things have been going, Irin will likely defeat his opponent and also rank up in the Hell's Angels. Yet, amidst all this, a lingering question remains. How can a Hell's Angels member risk exposing himself and his family on the unforgiving terrain of the internet? Vladimir Walter His story began in anonymity, a man navigating life's twists and turns. Yet, against all expectations, he found himself at the forefront of the Hell's Angels, showcasing the remarkable journey from ordinary to extraordinary. How did he do it? How does one rise from a nobody to the Hell's Angels president? Well, here's how Vladimir Walter Stadnik, the man who sets the ball rolling into a new era of organized criminal biker gangs, did it. Unlike your typical biker boss forged under the fire and pressure of war, he forced his way into the biker world unprovoked. He entered this world as an inexperienced kid with a hunger to do more, hanging out with the big boys club, and in no time became the national president of the Hell's Angels. Some hail him, others fear him, but most want his head on a spike. If there's smoke, he is the one lighting the fire, and if there's a VIP list of most wanted gang leaders, he isn't just on it, he wrote it. Stadnik, a figurehead in the criminal underworld for many years, was apprehended earlier today. From secret strategy meetings to notorious alliances and criminal undertakings that would easily rival a Hollywood thriller, Vladimir isn't your everyday biker with tattoos and the signal leather jacket on a Harley Davidson. He has all the twisty dark alleys of biker gangs at his fingertips. But how does a Ukrainian immigrant rise to head the biggest motorcycle club in Canada? What's so special about him, and how did he do it? Well, if you're into tales of roaring engines, buckle up for a wild ride. Born in 1952 into a family of Ukrainian immigrants in the Niagara Escarpment, Vladimir Stadnik grows up in a neighborhood known for its high rate of petty crimes. While he doesn't show signs of getting into the crime life, his intelligence doesn't go unnoticed. One of his teachers says this about him in the book Fallen Angel, he clearly had a great deal of natural intelligence, but he was impossible to motivate. It was almost like he didn't want to succeed, but then he did, and in ways no one thought he could. When he enters high school, Vladimir quickly gains a reputation as a drug dealer, and everyone now knows him as Nugget, a nickname he holds onto for years. Together with his love for dressing flamboyantly in extravagant jewelry, chains, and rings, as if drug trafficking isn't enough, he joins a biker gang while still in high school, and that's where his journey in the criminal motorcycle underworld begins. In his teenage years, everyone around Vladimir feels like he has outgrown his age. His decision to join the CACs vindicates their worries. Before joining the gang, it has a different name and is not so famous, except for its members' reputation of keeping their hair long and running it through holes they drill in their bike helmets. In his first act of gang dominance, he names the gang the CACs in reference to his Ukrainian heritage, and his time with them is filled with controversy. In October 1970, Vladimir is arrested with LSD tablets in his pocket. He makes bail, but is arrested shortly after for being in possession of hash with the intention to distribute it. In his preliminary hearing, his biker friends cause trouble inside and outside the courtroom, threatening the police officers who were about to testify against him. While he is convicted, it's just the beginning of an enduring legacy that would see his name etched in the history of motorcycle clubs. When he finishes his sentence, Stadnik comes out a reformed man, except he's not looking to abandon his ways but to find an upgrade. At the time, the Satan's Choice is the most powerful motorcycle club in Ontario, and luckily, Stadnik is friends with their president, Mario Rant. He wants to join Satan's Choice, but Mario thinks otherwise. 
he informs Stadnik that he can't join just because he is five feet four inches tall. Stadnik doesn't take the disrespect lightly, and this sets the ball rolling for years of bitter rivalry. While he abandons the CACs and joins the Wild Ones in 1977, Satan's choice partners up with the outlaws on the road to hell. Hamilton police officer John Gordon Harris talks about Stadnik, he was a little short guy, he certainly wasn't the most visible member of the gang. He was just a face in the crowd, he was almost invisible, but he did have a head on his shoulders. He goes all out to disprove Mario and the Satan's Choice Gang's decision not to take him in, and by 1978, he is the leader of the Wild Ones. In an era dominated by the Mafia, who hire outlaw biker gangs to do their dirty work, Stadnik is nowhere near satisfied by the dominance of the Wild Ones, viewed as inferior by other clubs. He contacts the national president of the Hells Angels Canada, Ibe Howe, looking for a merger. This action sends seismic shockwaves in the motorcycle underworld, and the outlaw MC, which had joined with Satan's Choice MC, takes notice of this. Despite warnings by other outlaws to stop associating with the Hell's Angels, Stadnik remains relentless. Due to this, most of the Wild Ones members get murdered. He takes the initiative to personally visit Hell's Angels President Ibhau in Montreal. While in Montreal, two contracted outlaws follow the Hell's Angels around to find the venue of this meeting. During the meeting held at Le Bon Bar, the two outlaws start a shootout, leaving three dead and many others. Injured Stadnik survives the massacre by hiding under the table. However, when he returns home, he finds that the Wild Ones members have already abandoned the group after agreeing to vote themselves out of existence. Not one to give up easily, he takes a stand to operate alone in Hamilton as the only Hell's Angel, and he is not done yet. This is just the beginning. By 1982, Stadnik had risen through the ranks to become a respected member of the Hell's Angels, and his ambition clearly beats his inability to hear and speak French. It is for this reason that he came from Ontario with another wild one turned Hell's Angels, Noel Mayu, who serves as his interpreter. Until they return to Hamilton in December 1982, Stadnik hopes to lie low for a while before setting up a Hell's Angels chapter in Ontario. But his plans are derailed by Mayu during their lengthy cocaine binge. Mayu and his stripper girlfriend, Connie Austin, get into a disagreement. Mayu unsuccessfully attempts to murder her, killing her four-year-old son and her best friend instead. Mayu also attracts attention to himself when he is caught wandering the streets, shooting at anyone within sight. While he is arrested and convicted, it is Stadnik who feels the most affected by his actions. The incident destroys the reputation of the Hell's Angels in Ontario even before Stadnik opens his chapter. However, in July 1983, Eve Bao, the National Hell's Angels president and Stadnik's mentor, establishes the first ever Hell's Angels chapter outside of Quebec. After convincing the Satan's Angels Biker Club with its three chapters to join the Hell's Angels, they wrote to the opening ceremony of the new chapter. Mario Parente, president of the Outlaws Club, sees them in a rash. Parente and his fellow outlaws spray bullets on the bus at Mr. Mug's Coffee and Donut Shop in Wawa, hoping to kill Michelle and Du. While his attempt is unsuccessful, and no one is killed, it serves as an indication of how the outlaws feel about the Hell's Angels moving into Ontario through Stadnik's newly formed chapter. Instead of a new Hell's Angels chapter in Ontario, the patchover eventually takes place on July 21, 1983, in Vancouver Island, where the Satan's Angels are based. Establishing a new chapter in British Columbia, on Stadnik's end, things aren't going as planned. Before he can pack his bags for another adventure, another problem arises, this time a bigger one on September 8, 1983. Butto is assassinated alongside Guy Galbert in their meeting to discuss another patchover for the Kitchener chapter of Satan's Choice. The assassin is later identified as Gino Greer, another outlaw, 
and for many who know Stadnik, that is almost the final straw to mark the end of his career, especially as he still is an affluent French speaker. Luckily, he has made friends in higher places, so even the new national president, Michel Langlois, believes Stadnik is the best suited to start the Ontario chapter of the Hells Angels at this time. On top of his full patch, he is wearing a filthy few patches, only given to those who kill for the gang. However, he still has a lot to do, considering the strength of the other outlaw gangs and the mafia families of Hamilton, he still has to keep a low profile. Just as Stadnik is beginning to find his feet, tragedy strikes again. This time he is in Quebec on his way to the first memorial of Butteau, when a Catholic priest driving in a hurry to meet the visiting Pope in Montreal runs him over on his motorcycle. Stadnik suffers third-degree burns from the resulting fire, leaving him with horrific scars all over his face and losing half of two of his fingers and much of his nose. Langlois requests his right-hand man, Rayon Lard, to organize for the 13th tribe biker gang from Halifax, who are interested in joining the Hells Angels, to guard Stadnik at St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton. Believing he is in danger, Stadnik also requests the police guard him, and they do so at night while the bikers watch him during the day. While some officers feel like it compromises their integrity to watch a known gang member, he is a citizen like everyone else. As a reward, the 13th Tribe Biker Gang is allowed to join the Angels, becoming the first in Atlantic Canada. Meanwhile, Stadnik becomes even more introverted thanks to the burns, and he moves to a trailer park in Carlisle, Hamilton. If there's ever a perfect definition of lying low, Stadnik has to be it. While living in the trailer, he establishes a good rapport with his neighbors, some of whom are later surprised to learn that he is part of a biker gang. While living in the trailer park, he tries to avoid trouble, and when his neighbors find a plastic bag full of amphetamines, the police put it back, hoping he'd pick it. But he isn't falling for their trap. His cautiousness extends to where he holds his numerous meetings with the Hells Angels, including his back office at the Rebel Roadhouse Bar in Hamilton, which he was using to plan drug routes and expansion strategies. The outlaws, led by Parente, are hot on Stadnik's heels. But when Parente is arrested, and Stadnik becomes the national chairman, his influence, especially in the drug trade, grow significantly. Stadnik's first order of business is to expand Hell's Angels' reach, and he starts with the Vikings, an outlaw bikers club based in Quebec City, where he places his friend and associate Maurice Bew in charge. In August 1988, he is arrested at the house of a known former Satan's Choice member and prominent drug dealer and smuggler, Douglas Freeborn. However, the charges are dropped after Freeborn covers for him claiming the 11 ounces of hash recovered from the raid had nothing to do with Stadnik and that they were his. During the court proceedings, he emphasizes that he is not even the president of the Hells Angels, hoping to continue his practice of laying low. Even though this is just the first in a series of drug-related activities that Stadnik is linked to, over the next few years by 1990, he has already established himself as one of the most dangerous Hells Angels in Canada but he continues expanding his drug empire. First, he identifies Manitoba as one of the most important provinces to expand into, as journalists Julian Shear and William Marston refer to it as the axis of distribution for any drugs moving east and west in the country. Ontario also becomes a crucial cog in the business as it is where most of the drugs from Montreal into the Prairie provinces are smuggled through. As he continues to establish connections across the country, he becomes the Hells Angels ambassador, not only traveling around to forge new alliances, but also to proceed with drug sales. Stadnik is good at eluding arrest and prosecution, and he is even daring enough to call Officer John Gordon Harris of the Hamilton Police at his workstation to complain about his solid gold belt buckle shaped in the form of the Angels' death head logo that the police had damaged while arresting him. He is confident that the police are unable to track him down, and he furthers the Hells Angels agenda by dividing other gangs and then absorbing them into the Angels' activities, 
including drug trafficking. By 1998, he has commissioned some of the most dangerous Hell's Angels chapters, including the Shea Brook chapter, which has since established itself as a dominant force in the world of outlaw biker gangs in Canada. In December 2000, Stadnik inspires a host of Ontario-based biker gangs, including Satan's Choice, the Lobos, the Vagabonds, the Paradise Riders, the Last Chance, and a section of the loners, to join his gang in a widely publicized ceremony. The mass patchover is one of its kind, leading to the instant growth of the Hells Angels in the greater Toronto area into the largest chapter in the world. However, having so many members means difficulty in leadership, which Stadnik is about to find out the hard way. In 2003, the sloppiness and mismanagement of information by some high-ranking officials working alongside Stadnik led to his arrest in Mexico. He is brought back to Canada and charged with 13 counts of murder, 3 counts of attempted murder, 1 count of conspiracy to commit murder, 2 counts of narcotics trafficking, and 2 counts of attempting to smuggle narcotics. While the charges don't stick due to a lack of concrete evidence, he knows the police are onto him and he apts to lie low and put a hold on his quest for expansion. But he can hide for so long before he is arrested again in 2004. This time, the police are prepared to put an end to his reign of terror, and he is sentenced to 20 years imprisonment for convictions ranging from conspiracy to murder to drug trafficking and involvement in gang activities. In 2014, he is paroled with strict instructions forbidding him to avoid any contact or association with biker gangs for five years, after which he walks back into the Hells Angels world. By the time of his conviction, Stadnik has played his part in ensuring the Hells Angels are set for life, having grown them in numbers and strength. From being born to immigrant parents to becoming one of the most influential figures in the history of the Hells Angels. Stadnik's journey is nothing short of remarkable. Foundation of Hell's Angels The origin of the Hell's Angels Motorcycle Club is a reflection of post-war America's landscape, an era marked by the return of battle-hardened soldiers to a rapidly changing society. Born from the disquiet and displacement of World War II veterans, the Hell's Angels found their beginnings in Fontana, California, in 1948. The club's roots trace back to various motorcycle groups, including the pissed-off bastards of Blooming Tun, from which the original members defected to form the now legendary Hells Angels. Contrary to popular belief, the club's intriguing name wasn't inspired by any dark or hellish folklore. Instead, it is said to be a nod to various fighter squadrons from both world wars, especially those with names like Hells Angels and Hells Birds. The unique spelling, dropping the apostrophe, became a defining trait distinguishing the motorcycle club from any military reference. In its nascent stages, the Hells Angels were more of a band of brothers than an organized entity. United by a shared love for motorcycles, the thrill of the open road, and a mutual sense of detachment from conventional society, their early days were marked by rides, camaraderie, and the occasional brush with law enforcement over minor disputes or brawls. Yet, it wasn't long before media attention began to spotlight the club, often highlighting their rebellious nature and framing them as outlaws. One cannot discuss the Hells Angels' rise to prominence without mentioning the 1965 article by Hunter S. Thompson titled Motorcycle Gangs, Losers and Outsiders. Thompson's Expose painted the club as a menacing group, a portrayal further cemented by his 1966 book, Hell's Angels, the strange and terrible saga of the outlaw motorcycle gangs. While the work was journalistic in nature, its dramatic depiction played a role in shaping public perception, branding the Hell's Angels as dangerous renegades. As the 1960s progressed, the Hells Angels found themselves intricately tied to the counterculture movement. Their presence at the infamous Altamonte Free Concert in 1969, where they were hired as security, led to a tragic incident that left a man dead. Further complicating their public image, 
This event became symbolic of the end of the peace and love era, and the beginning of a more turbulent decade. Through the years, the Hells Angels expanded not just in numbers but also in global presence. From Canada to Europe and Australia, chapters began springing up, each adopting the club's ethos while blending in. Local Cultural Nuances As with any group that grows in size and influence, the club faced internal rifts, external challenges, and increasing attention from law enforcement. One such rule was that whenever you meet a Hell's Angel and have your sunglasses on, you had better lift your sunglasses up and look that person in the eye. It was also recommended to him that if he was wearing riding gloves, he should remove them before shaking hands with a Hell's Angel. The image of the outlaw biker is as much a product of reality as it is a fiction. From the sun-beaten highways of America to the silver screen, the portrayal of leather-clad, bearded men riding roaring motorcycles has become synonymous with a certain brand of rebellion. To understand the outlaw image, one must delve into the socio-political landscape from which it emerged and its subsequent evolution. The 1950s were a time of significant transformation in America. The post-war economic boom brought prosperity but also introduced a palpable sense of homogeneity and societal conformity. In this setting, bikers, with their audacious lifestyles and overt rejection of societal norms, presented a stark contrast. However, it was a single event in 1947, years before the Hells Angels were founded, that sowed the seeds for the outlaw image, the Hollister Riot. Held in the small Californian town of Hollister, a motorcycle rally turned chaotic as bikers flooded the streets, leading to clashes with law enforcement. Though the disruption was relatively minor, it caught the eye of national media. Life magazine ran a feature with a now iconic image of a seemingly drunken biker amidst a sea of beer bottles. The incident, though blown out of proportion, portrayed motorcycle clubs as symbols of unrestrained freedom and, to many, chaos. The Hollister event, while not directly involving the Hell's Angels, paved the way for the outlaw archetype, which the club would eventually come to embody. The burgeoning film industry further embellished this image. Films like The Wild One, starring Marlon Brando, showcased bikers as the New Age rebels, adding layers of drama, aggression, and romanticism to the archetype. The Hell's Angels, with their distinctive patches, charismatic members, and often defiant stance towards authority, fit the outlaw mold almost too perfectly. As their reputation grew, so did the tales of their exploits, blurring the lines between fact and fabrication. Encounters with law enforcement, tales of territorial disputes, and alleged criminal enterprises further entrenched their outlaw status. The outlaw biker image is a tapestry woven from threads of truth, media sensationalism, film industry glamorization, and the biker's own embrace of the rebel ethos. For the Hells Angels, this image has been both a badge of honor and a cross to bear, influencing perceptions, interactions, and the very essence of their legacy. Women of the Hells Angels The world of motorcycle clubs, with its unwritten codes and deeply rooted traditions, often evokes an image of rugged masculinity. This perception, however, only scratches the surface of the intricate and multifaceted dynamics within these communities. While men may dominate the limelight, women have always played pivotal roles. Their presence, both revered and at times contentious, historically affiliated with motorcycle clubs, were commonly referred to as Old ladies, a term of endearment and respect signifying their status as the primary female partner of a club member. Being an old lady meant sharing in the club's lifestyle, its highs and lows, and enjoying a place of honor within the club's familial structure. These women were not mere bystanders, they often participated in rides, events, and even club decisions, albeit informally. However, the title of an old lady also bore the weight of certain expectations. Loyalty to the club and, more significantly, to her partner was paramount. In many clubs, women didn't wear the club's official colors or patches, but they might don badges that signified their association, 
often denoting them as the property of a particular member. This concept of property has been contentious, with some perceiving it as a sign of possession or control, while others within the club culture see it as a badge of belonging and protection. Parallel to the old ladies, there have been instances of women who maintained a more casual association with the club, often termed, sweet butts or the mamas. Their relationships with club members were less formal, sometimes fleeting, and they didn't possess the same status as an old lady. Their role was more fluid, often influenced by personal relationships and the particular dynamics of individual chapters. As with any subculture, the experience of women in the motorcycle club world varies widely, influenced by geography, club specifics, and individual personalities. However, it's undeniable that their roles, whether as old ladies, casual associates, or members of all-female clubs, have significantly shaped the landscape of motorcycle club culture. Their stories, though less often told, offer a unique lens into the heart of a world that, for all its rough exterior, is deeply rooted in bonds of love, loyalty, and shared passion. Within the intricate tapestry of motorcycle club culture, certain terms and titles carry weighty implications, none more so than the revered designation of an old lady. At a cursory glance, the term might seem antiquated or even derogatory, but in the lexicon of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, HAMC, and similar organizations, being an old lady is a role steeped in respect, responsibility, and a deep sense of belonging. One of the most emblematic symbols of an old lady's role is her vest or patches. While she doesn't don the club's official colors or main patch, she might wear badges that signify her association. Among the most debated of these symbols is the property of patch. To outsiders, this patch can seem possessive, even misogynistic. However, within the club, it's often viewed differently. While the notion of being property might seem antithetical to modern ideals of partnership in the context of the HAMC, it signifies protection, commitment, and a deep bond with a member. The world of an old lady is not without its challenges. The very nature of motorcycle club culture, with its frequent rides, late-night meetings, and brushes with the law, means that she often has to stand strong, managing home and hearth and sometimes facing societal judgment. Yet, many old ladies embrace their roles with pride. For them, the sense of community, the bonds forged with other women in similar roles, and the passionate commitment to their partners make the challenges.